You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by MyAx, one of the fastest options platforms in the world. MyAx is now trading options on the Spikes Volatility Index, offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction for confident trading, all for competitive exchange fees. It's time to make a change and give yourself an edge with Spikes. Learn more about Spikes at www.myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for information purposes only and are not intended to provide and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. Welcome back to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as of course from the ever exciting, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network. If I sound a little bit different, it's because I'm not coming to you from our studio in Chicago. No, I'm coming at you from the scenic and sunny Options Industry Conference here in Miami, Florida. It's been a great week, a lot of great content. Hopefully you guys have been enjoying all the content that's hit the network already and all the stuff that's still to come. We have a huge backlog of shows coming at you, listeners, so stay tuned for that. But we're going to wrap up our content here this week looking over at the, the Volatility Views program. It's a great time to talk about some volatility, and I have two great guests to help me do just that. First off, Holding down the MyAx hot seat this week, it is John Smolin, the EVP and Head of Exchange Traded Products and Strategic Relations over there at the MyAx Exchange Group. John, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Mark. This is fantastic. Great to be here. Uh, looking forward to uh, talking some ball. Yeah, should be fun. And sitting next to him, I'm pleased to say for the first time, you've been in our studio before, but for the first time, you and I face-to-face -face in the same time zone, let alone the same building, uh, for Volatility Views, Simon. Simon Ho, the CEO of T3 Index, the, the father of Spike, shall we say. How about that? Spike's father. How does that sound for a nickname? Oh, I like it. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, usually you're joining us, Simon, and due to your commitment to the show, I have to lodge you, but it's like four o'clock in the morning, your time, you're half asleep. Now you're, yeah. you're actually awake. There's daylight outside. It must be must be a rare treat to talk some volatility uh, at this actual normal human hour. Absolutely. It's refreshing. And you're not going to know what's going to, you know, I'm going to be just a different person. <laughs> totally another level. We're going to get a whole new Simon on this show. So without further ado, we're going to kick things off. We've been looking at a lot of interesting things here at the conference. We're going to keep that going with our volatility viewpoint segment. It's time to welcome thought leaders from throughout the volatility trading world. It's time for Volatility Viewpoint. All right, welcome to the Volatility Viewpoint. This is indeed the portion of the show where we welcome on guests and proceed to pick their brains about all things volatility. And since we're here at the Options Industry Conference, we're going to start talking about that first. First off, John, let me start by congratulating you. I know you're, a huge weight has been lifted off your shoulders. I can see as you're sitting here now, you're, you're smiling. You're very happy because the OIC 2019 just came to an end. Uh, we had the Crowd of Fame presentation, which I was very honored uh, to be a part of as the host. And it seemed like the whole event went off very smoothly and without a hitch. So congratulations, sir, on an excellent, excellent event. I thank you. It was, uh, it was a big, big team effort for us at MyX. Uh, everybody in the, in the firm in some shape or form was, was impacted 
and involved directly. And you don't know. You put it together. It's, it's kind of like a, a, an athletic event. You got your plan, your game plan. You put it out, and you, you, you see if your plays work. And, and we, got, we got the perfect combination. We got a really great place here down at uh, the Trump Doral. We got great hosts like yourself. Uh, the panel was great. The content was great. And then I, I have to admit, this resort is, is five-star. And, and the, the, um, the people that's, that took care of us here, the food and everything was outstanding. And uh, all in all, uh, I am extremely pleased with how it went um, because uh, yeah, they don't remember you for the good ones. They remember yes. you for the bad yes. ones. And, yes. and uh, so... As far as I'm concerned, as a friend would say, that uh, check the box. We did the job, and and uh, Mike's held held its head high and, and proud. You have to agree about the staff here at this this hotel. I've never seen more accommodating staff at any event I've ever been to. They will literally almost give you the shirt. If it's raining, here, take my umbrella. So you, it's almost, I almost feel bad. They are so nice. It, it is, uh, I, we've talked about it here as we've been setting up and doing our shows, just how accommodating they are. So I hope they could travel to every event we do because they're, they're the nicest <laughs> staff I've ever encountered. And, and Simon, of course, uh, you just came off yesterday, uh, the big volatility panel. Uh, so walk us through that. First off, another congrats, John, to, uh, I think, including that. That's been something fun. We don't really talk a lot of product asset class categories here at this event, you know? And so including something like that, getting that, A, gives incentive to more of the end users and practitioners to come down and the traders who maybe think, oh, it's just kind of an exchange event. I'm not going to go. But now we're talking, talking some of their wheelhouse, so they get excited for that. And also it mixes up the content. Yeah, no, the... I, I, I tend to, I, as a former trader, I, I try and look at the world in kind of a practical approach and pragmatic as to what you can actually accomplish. And I did put down very few ground rules with my, uh, my boss, my CEO, about, about the conference. And one was I wanted to avoid any panels on reg. I go, that is... That I is, thank you. On behalf of the entire conference, <laughs> I thank you for that. That is, that is a battle that's fought uh, way above my pay grade. And there was, there was, I don't see the, uh, the value in debating it. Um, really smart people are talking about it every day. And then um, as to, to paraphrase uh, a, a friend, uh, Chris Kincannon, that we were not going to have any man bun latte drinking crypto traders <laughs> at our conference, which I... I, I Hold on, he, he does a crypto show. Now. I do. I know, no man bun. But <laughs> Kincannon's uh, hilarious, and, and I'm... Listen, by the time I'm done, I'm going to have invented that line, but uh, Chris used it last, last fall, and I, I almost fell out of my chair, and I said, I got to use that line, so... Well, Simon, you were on uh, one of those new panels, the volatility panel. Uh, we have it recorded, so our audience will get a chance to check it out for themselves eventually. But I want you to kind of give us your thoughts. What were some of your, what were some of the interesting conversations on the panel? What were some of the takeaways? And I did hear, uh, maybe we'll save that for a little bit later. There also was a big announcement. We'll get to that in a little bit as well. Yep. Sure. So look, I, I've never been to an RIC before. This is the first time I've had the honor of doing that. And I thought it was absolutely excellent. Just want to echo your sort of thoughts uh, for, for John, because I think it was a really you well done thing. told me outside thing. before, though. You said, you, where was the regulatory panel? You came here just yeah, for that. Yeah, that's right. That, I, I missed that one. Actually, you know, just, just a snippet. Um, the the lengths that they went to at Mike's to, to get this to be the, the sort of conference as well, it was, um, was there was a little known thing that... Um, so Tom Gallagher, the CEO of MyX, actually wanted to have a fireworks display. I don't know if you saw that the other yes. night there. Yep. So the problem is that planes fly over the Trump Tower. Extreme, extremely right? low, yes. Yeah. And so he had to get a permit to be able to do that, and the planes were diverted for nine minutes so that we could have the fireworks I display. I talked to him because <laughs> one came through during that. I remember I had, you told me that, and I was surprised. So I talked to him afterward. He said he was the fireworks guy started too early. And so it was like right. an Italian plane or something. So I said, Whoops. well, you know, they got a nice show as they were coming in. You know, they were either terrified that there yeah. were explosions off their wing or they kind of enjoyed it, you know, one or the other. Uh, like, oh, my God, we're exploding. They're welcoming us to America. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so anyway, on to more serious topics. Yeah, the Vol panel was excellent. You know, we had some really good people on there. We had um, a guy from Citadel, um, LT. We had um, people from Peak 6, and we also uh, had someone from the, the DPMM for VIX for the longest um, time. And 
it was a very, very good session, I think. And, and frankly, the fact that you're telling me that this doesn't happen every time is quite a surprise to me because at the end of the day, this is the options industry conference. We should be talking about volatile as an asset class. Unfortunately, it is, like John said, a little bit more on the reg side. Usually a lot of more of these other kind of 10,000 foot things, they don't often get into the weeds. And I, I like to see that they're, they're doing that this year. So what, what were some of the interesting conversations, some of the interesting takeaways and discussions on this panel? So one of the items was, um, could volatility indices be expanded to other asset classes? And I think there was quite a, a mixed view here about that. Um, I, I personally think that it's unlikely that you can get a whole plethora, unlike you know, indices on various things, you know, whether it be stocks or what, what have you. I think that in volatility space, you have to have a, a very specific set of, of circumstances in order for it to be fruitful in the long run. I mean, we've seen a few volatility products added and then subsequently delisted. You know, it, it, it's not hit and miss, but certainly I think the certain ingredients need to be in place. So I think that was an interesting conversation. We also talked about, the, um, obviously, the events of last year and how that has impacted uh, product development and, and, and um, so on and innovation. Um, overall, I think that we're in a good spot. I mean, the in options industry here is very well. We saw record uh, volumes in terms of turnover last year and trading. Um, I think it's very, very healthy. And the fact that, you know, we're coming in to disrupt something else, I mean, a lot of people have said that that's, that's good. Competition is good and uh, it, it will serve to grow the entire pie. So was there consensus? Is volatility an asset class? I know that's still a contentious issue to some people. Did you at least arrive at consensus on that? Well, all of us have vested interests. <laughs> we're, we're, we're volatility professionals. So, yes, there was unanim unanimous agreement that uh, it, it is an asset class. Any surprise debates? Any surprise uh, bit of contentiousness on, on, the, on the session there? No, you are completely incorrect. <laughs> uh, not really. I think there's definitely different views about the aftermath of the, um, you know, the apocalypse last year and, and what we do from here. My thoughts on that were that um, I'm surprised there hasn't been more innovation take place as a result of that. After all, options are the most dynamic tool in the world to reshape distributions. We should perhaps maybe be thinking, putting our minds to building a, an ETP that isn't perhaps so vulnerable by using these tools. Are you saying there probably won't be another XIV anytime soon? Is that what you guys are hinting at there? Uh, you know what? I, I actually, it's such a popular product. And it people, was. people even now, they're trying to, they're gagging to get their hands on it. And they don't like the fact that it's been reduced to half the size oh, the of it. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah, it's neutered. Yeah. That's right. So I don't know. I, I think given enough time, it'll probably come back. That to me was one of the more surprising takeaways from that event when we saw the, the wake of it and we heard the feedback from our audience. And we started hearing about it from all different corners, you know, not just the professionals and experience and the active vol guys who are listeners of this show, but from your proverbial grandmother in Iowa and others listening to our basic show saying, hey, I had XIV, what happened? And I remember saying, how, why did you get into, who, where was the barrier to entry for you to stop? I think it's, it seemed like somewhere along the way, somewhere in the industry, we dropped the ball where you know, maybe the broker dealers, maybe the exchanges, maybe kind of collectively, but you know, they were putting XIV up there on the ETF platform, you know, next to SPY, next, you like SPY, right? Here's XIV, it's, it's the same kind of safe, easily understandable thing, let alone it's an inverse. I mean, when, you, when they first announced VIX and coming from an old SPX market maker, I was like, oh, okay, at the money, OEX, and then SPX, that's going to be great, but it's going to be it's going to be the most institutional product ever, right? It's going to be a layoff pit for all the SPX guys to lay off their ball wrists to some, to some poor schmo market maker from whoever's going to take this down. I don't even know. It seemed like it was going to be the most institutional thing ever. So if you had told me 10 years later, there'd be not only would retail be trading that, but they'd be trading the inverse of that. I would say that that's mind-boggling, and yet that's exactly where we found ourselves. And I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what the solution to that is. Maybe it's uh, some people have proposed, uh, you know, uh, like we have level one, level two, level three for options. Maybe something along those lines with some of these more esoteric and exotic, you know, ETPs, right? That have obviously a level of nuance and sophistication to them. Maybe that's the approach. I don't know, but it certainly seems like, uh, at least for the time being, we won't be seeing any any XIVs again anytime anytime soon. I think I think the wreckage of that was, and the regulators certainly. I know somewhere recently, in the last few months, some firm, some poor firm, actually applied for not just a crypto product, but an inverse crypto product. And I was like, wow, you're you're combining the two things that the regulators hate the most. You have literally a zero chance of this being approved. And of course, that was uh, that was indeed uh, the case. But any any other surprise, interesting takeaways from that panel, Simon? Um. There was a bit of debate a little bit about, oh, I questioned whether or not um, all of the participation in the VIX ETPs was actually from retail. I mean, that, that's generally the, the folklore about that. And as far as, you know, I, I also buy into that to some degree, but I have a feeling that a, a lot of the usage was actually professional um, because, you know, it was such a, a very 
a consistent ecosystem and the bid-off spread was very tight, you trade the VXX in pennies and so on, um, and people are shorting it. Now, that's not something to me that I think a lot of you know, retail yeah. people would do. So, shorting inverse volatility, that's yeah. a, it's another layer of abstraction on top of a thing that's already pretty abstract uh, to uh, begin with. You know, that, I don't think you're right, I don't think we've seen the end of that. People ask us all the time, when will there be another XIV? And I keep saying, not, not probably not anytime soon, not probably this year, probably not next year, but you're right, eventually someone's gonna try to tilt at that windmill again, because it was so insanely profitable right up until it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> there was one thing, actually, I should mention, is there was a bit of an announcement during the panel. I had heard. I had heard some rumors about that. So, yeah, John, how, long, how, many, how many times now have we had you guys and Shelly and Simon on, and then listeners have written in even already, saying, hey, wh what's up with the underline? What's up with the future? So I hear we have some actual uh, announcements on that front, sir. Yeah, no, it, 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 we have been actively searching for a uh, solution to trade a futures product. Um, many um, different layers of discussion over time, and but we announced the other day that we, we formed a partnership agreement with the Minneapolis Grain Exchange. Uh, Mark Bagan, uh, the CEO out there, and his team, uh, we think we found the right partner. Um, they want to be our partner. They're excited to be our partner. They have the capability of, of helping us uh, get to where we want to go with, or with. and I believe that it, this is a first step towards a uh, probably a, 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 a relationship that could go pretty quickly down the road. So walk us through, uh, obviously people want the nitty gritty details. When can we see this future? What are some of the, you know, the contract specs? What can we expect from this thing when it, when it launches? All good questions. The, uh, the con you know, we're, I'll let uh, Simon touch on the contract specs on it, but um, we are working uh, with the team at Minneapolis um, uh, and um, Jacob and JD up there. We, we, we think uh, we should get there pretty quick, but then we start dealing with, with the CFTC. Um, they, they, uh, CME is part of this uh, project in that uh, MJX uses Globex for distribution, so we have to work through their team also. Uh, but we're fingers crossed, third quarter launch. Uh, that's what the, that's what the uh, the goal is, and then then we we get up and running, and then you know to kind of futures isn't just the only uh, speed bump we have. We also have to work on on functionality internally at MyX, which we're we're hard at work on and building the business to, to be balanced for market makers and for, uh, for the brokerage world. And Simon, I'm sure you can uh, speak to a little bit of, uh, of the mechanics. You know, listeners, I like to get into the weeds, so feel free to regale them, sir. Yeah, sure. So uh, you talked about contract specifications. Obviously, they're fairly, it's a well-worn path with VIX, so um, obviously those basic things will be somewhat similar to that. We have um, some other ideas, too, uh, in terms of, something that stuff that will be kind of innovative in terms of auctions and so on so uh, there's a lot going on as, as john said i mean obviously you have the reg team working on um, this thing with cftc lots of things that need to be passed uh, before that happens we're obviously excited that we're going to have an underlying because clearly that's going to help everybody because right now you know we launched we, we launched um just over two months ago with the options they're doing fine everything is operating smoothly our auctions went without a hitch, so we're very happy with everything, but clearly in order for us to really sort of perpetuate some volume, we're gonna to need to have some way to hedge. So as a interim step, actually between times, um, we will um, likely be making available tied trades as well. So that's a oh, okay. precursor step, so that, that would be That'll very That'll sure make the market makers and the uh, customers, the institutions very happy that they can, uh, they can put the, and those, those are gonna be available soon or? Yes. Oh, great. Yes. Perfect, so there you go. So that, that's all the people I've lost track here how many people have written in asking about the winds of future coming. Right. So there you go. Yeah. All, all of you who have asked that question. Uh, Q3, hopefully, again, the regulatory thing is always a bit of a moving target. Uh, but let's hope for let's hope for September 1st, John. We'll be sitting here uh, talking about uh, talking about look at those futures trade like crazy. It will be an enjoyable <laughs> Labor Day. Uh, we can go from draft beer to bottle. They'll be outstanding. You know, we'll be very happy. <laughs> So yeah, this has been, again, a fascinating event. I've, I've enjoyed being a part of it. I haven't seen all of it, quite frankly, because I've kind of been in here doing this for the best, this is what we do for the better part of three days here. I'm amazed, quite frankly, I still had a voice. I told our producer towards the end of the day, maybe ease me up on Friday so I can 
have, an, have a voice for the panel. I don't want to be out there squeaking. Uh, but it worked out. I somehow, I think the cigar bar last night really helped to uh, preserve the vocal cords uh, for You today. did quite well. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, and listen, if you've been listening to our conference coverage this week, listeners, you know exactly what we're talking about there. But before we wrap up the Vol Viewpoint, any other interesting takeaways you guys had from the conference? Could be the Vol space or maybe just the conference in general. Obviously, it's kind of a, a meeting of the minds of the entire options industry. Does anything really resonate with either of you guys? Well, you know, I, I'm just as I sit here and, and we were going over the uh, what happened with Vol in, in, in February of last year and what happened to the markets, it, it began to kind of, you know, I, I was kind of showing my age here, but it felt a lot like what happened in the equity markets coming out of 1989. Now, most of your, your, your listeners weren't around, but 87 crash really hurt the market. But then having it again in 89 really, really hurt it. And then we, we came out of the real estate collapses and, and the markets got, uh, you know, it was a difficult time to trade options. And a lot of the mistakes were made and, and it took a while for it to heal. And then when it healed, it got better. And it got better through competitive markets. It got competitive through people coming back who understood uh, the markets a little better. And, and then eventually, you know, it took into 93 and 94 where it really took off. But, but there's going to have to be some healing. And I think uh, the, the volatility products that, that Simon's created and MyX's launch is going to be uh, timed well in that we'll be kind of launching into it. And, and Hopefully, you know, it's probably a two-year cycle from when we launched, but um, there's going to be a lot of exciting stuff. I mean, VIX is not the only product. It needs competition, and I think they'll, they recognize that a, a healthy Spikes product will make a healthy VIX product. But it, it's interesting, the parallels, and, and I, this has happened, and those markets came back stronger than ever, and I, I, I'm kind of in the same camp. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that concept. I think that Vol as an asset class has truly stamped itself as a, as a critical component of the machinery in financial markets. So yes, there may be a bit of a lull right now because of what happened a year ago and so on. But you know, it, it is such a dynamic thing and it is such a good tool to have. It's causally negatively correlated to equities, which a lot of people need that. Um, it's, it's it's an asset class in its own right. You can trade the vol of vol. I mean, it's just it's 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 amazing the things that it can do. So I I, I think the prospects for the volatility complex are extremely bright. Um, although CBOE may not prefer it that way, I mean, there is competition, and I ultimately think that would be better for the both of us uh, in the long run. Um, I've also been very buoyed by not only my meetings, so I was in New York last week, and I, I've been here obviously all week at the OIC, but the number of people that come up and say that they're really excited about seeing some competition, it really does buoy us that, to, to, to believe that this could be very successful. Yeah, this is an industry the end of the day that has, has grown on competition, right? We have 16 exchanches now, so that's, uh, if that's not emblematic of it, I don't know what is. Uh, so you're right. I think people welcome some new competitors and some new entrants into the space because it, it lifts all boats mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day. You mentioned Vol of Vol. Do we have an up update on the future? Do we have anything on, on the Viking? What's the, uh, what's the status of that? <laughs> I think that Shelley is coming around to that term. I'm really? Me, me Paul really? is going to be very we, we excited. Do some, we do some excellent branding on this program. Hey, we already changed VXX. We could we could brand the Viking. We have great power on this show. Oh, it's people power. I mean, congrats to you for making it, getting rid of that power damn of B. Power of the audience. Oh, that yeah. B was that was atrocious. That's so annoying. <laughs> but, but in terms of the the index, yes, we'll have a little bit of news on that. We are working with Mike to uh, sort of do the calculation. So in a couple of weeks, hopefully, we'll be able to talk a bit more detail in more detail about how it's devised because it's actually somewhat different to to VIX, and I think. It, uh, to the point where I think we could potentially commoditize or productize it. I think it has some properties that are quite different than the underlying. You have to get it so that it has, when it gets down, like the same range as VIX, so if it gets into the low 70s, you know, okay, here we go, it's time to rock and roll. VIX and, and spikes, or I should say Viking, uh, ready to roll. If it's like, you know, uh, 20 versus, it'll be a different thing. So yes. 70, perfect. Yeah, that's my one request for you. Make my life easier. I have to do all these products all the time. But Mark, will <laughs> we call expiration the Viking funeral? What yeah, will we do? there's a lot you can do there. Every every month, you could launch a little boat and shoot an arrow into right. it on fire. Yeah, cool. That's this big in Sydney, isn't it? Huge Viking population there. So I, I think there's a lot you could do with that. They uh, made it there, I heard. <laughs> you know, next year at the conference, you have your booth, you have the, the Viking hats. Yeah, there's a lot. Oh, I mean, nice. Shelly might not like that. He says he's not a Vikings the team fan, but yeah. we, we can get past that a little bit, so. you know. <laughs> All right, speaking of getting past stuff, I want to get you guys uh, into the program a little bit, too. It wouldn't be the Vol Views without some of your questions, so let's wrap it up here with some of your volatility voicemail. 
It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL, posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, right. or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, and welcome to the Vol Voicemail. This is the portion of the show where you guys take the reins. We're going to skip past all your legions of questions about when the future is coming because we, we just got an answer uh, to that. So let, let's scroll here a little bit. I like this guy, Allegheny Lad. He chimed in. He said, cheers to the listener who said they hedged their VXXB, and now it's VXX. Listen, well, Allegheny Lad, you, you should listen to the show. Uh, but he said, they hedged their VXXB downside with alcohol. I feel their pain, and I raise my glass in solidarity. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I think they meant upside, upside with alcohol. I find a nice Jameson on the Rock seems to hedge most effectively, but your mileage may vary. Thanks for your fine program. Well, you're welcome, Allegheny. We had a listener write in a while ago, and uh, we were talking about different ways to hedge the upside. And everyone leans short, so everyone, how do you hedge your upside? All different ways. This listener who said he hedges with alcohol. <laughs> he gets short, and then he just hedges with alcohol. And that, I thought that was kind of funny. Clearly, Allegheny Lad uh, did as well. Here's a good one. I actually would like to get your opinion on this, uh, John. It's kind of a fun one. Um, here it is. Because, John, you've been uh, pretty much all over the options space, you know, from trader to market maker, now with the exchange and many stops in between. Uh, Charlie Shee C says, I have a quick question for the show. Uh, spoiler alert, Charlie, this is not a quick question. Actually, it's pretty lengthy. But uh, he wants to know, what is the weirdest thing you've seen in the options market? John, you, you've seen a few things. So I'm going to put this one over to you. What, 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 that's a hard question. Uh, no, it is. It, it, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. It's, it's actually a very interesting story. If you give me a minute or two. I'll give you two and a half. Thank you. Yeah. So it actually occurred on 9-11, on the reopening on 9-18 or 9-17. And um, at the time, I was, I was running Goldman's uh, floor trading businesses in Chicago. Uh, we had 2,000 names and 175 traders that, that um, I had either direct report to or, or they, they to me or, or one away. So I was worrying about hundreds and hundreds of positions. M many were okay, but you know the the, the market was going to certainly go down, and I'm get a tap on the shoulder, and here it is. You know, market's heading to towards being down 10 percent on the week. You know, at the end of the week, and I get a tap on the shoulder from one of our traders, and he's white, and he says. Um, ATK, which was Allied Technologies, which was a, a, an arms maker, he goes, it looks up 200 points. <laughs> it, it was a $40 stock. He goes, it, lo it looks up 200. And I'm like, what do you mean it looks up? He goes, yeah, they make the ammo for the A-10 Warthog, right? Obviously, the, we've already started, and we're, we're convinced we're going to war. And I go, what? I'm like, you're, like, I'm worrying about bank stocks opening zero. I couldn't even and, process and, that in the moment, he, yeah. he comes to me with the one name that's going to be up a couple <laughs> hundred points. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And, and, and now this becomes, and now I've got to physically involve myself into it. I'm like, okay, because this is a big one. Because I look at the position, we're short delta, we're short gamma, and I, take, I, I run out the scenarios, and up 200 bucks, it's a $10 million loser. And I'm like, oh my God, and this is a tiny position, but it's just <laughs> naked short stock, that's all it is. So I said, okay, and I had learned this from an old, I started my career as a specialist clerk in the uh, equity world on the American Stock Exchange. So I had learned some tricks on how equity specialists trade. So I said, okay, this can be a, a, a card game, or not a card game, but a, yeah, it's a bluff. So I go to the machine and I go, the, 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 the stock is uh, indicated like, you know, 180, 280. So I go, okay, sell 100,000 to 250. Sell 100,000 to 260, sell 100,000 to 280. He's I, loading up the book. I, I, I go, fine. If you're going to open it up there, I'm going to sell. And I'll, I'll take, because I think by the end of the day, my, my instincts on that day said there are certain days it didn't matter what, what the market was going to do. At the end of the day, all stocks would be down. Okay, they, some could open up, but by the end of the day, I always used to look at the market in terms of uh, how people responded on a, on a personal level. And if you're a trader and you've got uh, 80 stocks that are red and five are green, at some point during the day, you're going to sell the five green ones. 
right? The meeting the up stocks. So now he reindicates the stock. He puts it up there 150, 200. I go, great. 250 or 200? <laughs> okay, no cancel. He spooked I, him. I keep, uh, my, my, there was, my markets were out there. I roll my stuff down. I roll it down. Now we get it down. Probably an hour later, the stock gets to like 100 bid at 150. He reindicates it. And I, I come right back at him. I go, I don't think you got anything. I, 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 because they, they won't give me a look, you know, it's New York Stock Exchange specialists. They think they're the, the smartest guys in the world at the time, and they didn't need your help. But I said, okay, well, I'm going to put my stock out there. If you want to open it at 150, I'll sell 80, I'll sell 75,000. And we pushed it. And finally, at about noon, he gets the stock to 80 bid at 100. And I'm like, okay, I offer 50,000 at 100. And I, I then go 85 bid for, for 20,000. I'm like, I'll take my, my, and so now I make the market 85 bid at 100. He opens the stock at 85. I buy my, my stock. Some trading goes on. I, get, I, I, I actually buy some calls. I raise the calls. I need to buy units. So I buy the calls. Stock trades up to like 90. I, I sell out of the stock. I, I, I take care of my problem. We probably lose about 700 grand. But a lot better than the 10 million. 10 million. <laughs> and and then and then I turn around and, and and it's like okay and I turn to the trader and I go we'll have a conversation about yeah. this tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, did you have any time to do anything else that day? Or just maybe no. That, that, that was my whole open. morning, and I'm I'm getting and, and, and there's we, stuff going on that day. Oh yeah, I, I had <laughs> it wasn't I, a quiet day. I had some great great traders, but that I had that one caused me a lot of issues for that it did it it. It needed my attention, and, and again, I couldn't ask a, a, a young trader to say, okay, you're gonna go short a million shares up, up 200. That was my job. Um, you know, I had other things, I remember that day, the same thing as this is going on, I'm staring at the screen because one of my uh, more senior traders thought, thought it was appropriate to sell 5,000 puts in Wells Fargo at, paid, at, at 35, he sold five, four or 5,000 on a roll on the 35 line, and Wells Fargo's 41 goes out on, you know, on, on the crack, on 9-11, and, or, or 9-10 on Monday, and he comes to me, uh, like, I, I saw it, but he came to me hat in hand, he goes, oh, I'm kind of legged on a short put position, and, and, and I stared at that screen for three weeks, and finally, the day before expiration, to trade 35. It took, it, but it took three weeks to get down there. But I just, re, I just remember that, uh, going to that trader. I, I, I was like, uh, we're never going to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But yeah. the, the eight, I had a couple like that, the ATK one. Um, I had another one, which was fascinating. Um, stock uh, guy came to me, and it was five to four. And all of a sudden, the raise wheel to SIBO starts going off. And I'm, I sell 10. It's a small stock. Sell 10, sell 10. Anthem Electronics, it was called. No, that's always a good sign when a couple minutes where they close, the race starts lighting right, right. up. So, so they sell 10, and, and, and our clerk. And usually they're making you hit, get hit on like what, 100 Delta stuff, right? Yeah, it's, it's all yeah. big stuff. And, and, the, and the clerk's like, uh, hey, you know, you sold 177. And I'm like, okay, let's widen out. And I, I, I've seen this, this movie before. And I just pick up the, I, I go to the machine, I go buy 25,000. I buy 25,000 shares, and um, the market goes a little wide, but that's it. So now the bell goes off at 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock, and at 3.01, they announce that they're getting taken over up $25 higher, right? <laughs> so I'm holding the tickets, and a guy walks by me, and he's the broker <laughs> for the ticket. <laughs> and I go to him. I'm like, hey, Mike. Where's this? Uh, he has no idea what I'm going to ask him. I'm like, hey, JK43, where's that office? And he goes, oh, great. And he calls and comes and he goes, it's in, you know, Three Oaks or, or Sherman Oak, uh, Sh what's it, Thousand Oaks, California. I go, oh, great. Anthem Electronics is located four <laughs> miles away. <laughs> and I, I go back to the, I go to the exchange. I go, they're four miles away. You don't think there's anything here? And, and, you know, and it basically, you know, I, that was like my first introduction to the commission. And eventually I complained so hard 
the CBO puts me on the phone with the with the SEC person who does these insider trading things. And he said to me, he goes, listen, he goes, I feel your pain. He goes, but unless they absolutely admit they did it, he goes, it's very hard for us to prove there's insider trading. That, that, was, a, that was a stunning realization to me. I, I came to it a little bit later than you, obviously. But when I first walked on the floor uh, of the SIBO, and I would, you know, the last 10 minutes of the day, you're like, oh, it's good stuff. Let's go. And that's when I saw all the old timers rolling up their stuff, putting the machine, and leaving. And I said, where, where are you guys going? This is where all the pain. They're like, no, kid, you don't want to be here. This is when the pickoff paper comes in. And I was like, well, you're crazy. You're grumpy old men. And then it uh, turns out you start all of a sudden, here comes a you know, Goldman broker running in. I go, where's the market on these calls? I got 10000 to buy. You're like, we've done 100 contracts all day. Now you want to buy 10000 And then you start realizing, oh, yeah, this is all shady. And, uh, and so I, I did the same thing to you. I, our broker was a floor fish. I said, hey, come on. This is clear. This is, this is like, let's just use Goldman as an example. It could be any firm. Goldman broker with a Goldman customer. The next day, the, at night, a Goldman Goldman analyst upgrades the freaking stock. It's like, you know, it's this clearly a, a chain of, of custody here. And it's like, yeah, kid, no, we've tried that a million times and and don't don't even but don't even waste your breath. <laughs> and so yeah, I, I learned that the hard way as well. That sometimes uh, sometimes that uh, that 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 fight doesn't go. Uh, your way. A, over the years, I, I came up with a handful of very creative uh, answers to the brokers, and they would do that. They would I, I would go, you had six hours to come into my pet. And you want to now put on something that you've been studying yes. for five yes. days it, and give me a chance to make a market in, in two basically minutes. two <laughs> minutes and get it hedged. And I would say no. I, I'd say here's the deal. As 3.30 approaches or 2.30 Chicago time, I would say I take 100 off my ask every five minutes as we get closer. That's actually to smart. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> But uh, one of my favorite lines that the brokers would remember goes, well, where do I get this done? And I'd go, Italy. I understand there's an outstanding market in Italy for these. You, you'll, you'll be best served there. Good luck. <laughs> Simon, it's going to be hard to compete with that, but if you have any, that's why I was saving that question for you, John. Yeah, I know you'd have thank some. You. I knew you'd have some nuggets for that. If you got anything you want to add in there, but feel free. But it might be hard to compete with that one. Yeah, I think so. Plus, this guy has a few years on me, so <laughs> <laughs> his story trove is a bit bigger always, than mine. I'm sorry, people always forget about 9-11, too, is that, you know, they had kind of the worst-case scenario, because obviously everything was shut down, but then it rolled through expiration. That, so even a savvy guy who had maybe some front-month hedges and thought he would have a couple of days to work out of it, that all went away. And so you had crazy naked things uh, popping up all that no one ever anticipated in a million years. So, uh, yeah, it was... Definitely, uh, definitely a crazy, crazy one. Let's see. Let's end on, uh, we'll do that time for one more. Let's do uh, Miller. Miller wants to know, hello, volatility views. Well, hello, Miller. Uh, I love this show. Well, we love you too. Uh, my question, is there some sort of volatility summit where the different players in the space get together to discuss the issues in the market, how to address them, and what's coming down the road? Well, we kind of just mentioned the panel here. And actually, we were funny. We were just joking about this before the show, weren't we? That uh, I know you, don't, you just got off planning an event, so you don't want to plan any more events anytime soon. But who knows? Maybe down the road, maybe when the futures launch, what do you think? Maybe there, will there be a... Uh, a Myax or Spikes Volatility Summit, something along those lines? Interesting. Um, really good question from Miller there. Um, we've, been th we, we've been kind of knocking it around, getting ready about how we should do this. And it's, it's a combination of, of, you know, Simon's out there doing it as a one-man shop right now. But at some point, I believe that we will probably come back with something where we do like a five-city, one-day, uh, meet at 11, coffee, uh, quick lunch, five-hour summit cocktail, and then we go to the next city, and 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 then after that we open up our you know our sales team and our, our development team uh, goes at it kind of hand to hand. But you know, there's people learn face to face, and it is something that if we want to compete with 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 the other guys in the space, we're gonna we need to get out there and, and press the flash. So absolutely, I, I see. A series of events occurring. We'll time it around futures. We'll time it around our functionality, and we'll. we'll but I think the demand for it—the first time that we put up our first big trade—it's going to—it's and it will take off, and and we'll be in in demand to get out and and, and talk about what we do. Well, Simon, it sounds like you got your travel schedule planned for you for the uh, for the foreseeable future. A road show across America. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, of migrating, but I'm not sure <laughs> if Trump's going to let me. So. <laughs> I don't know. At the very least, maybe the time zones will be a little bit more manageable if you did. You know, but, but Mark, you know, staying on that with seeing how successful you are in, in getting your message across like this, 
this would be something that, that a, a firm like ours should, should think about doing something jointly with because this is a good way to get the message across. This does reach people like Miller and a bunch of other people. It kind of reaches a nice swath because we get this crowd, we get the professional crowd, we get the institutional crowd, but also a lot of the active retail who is, as you mentioned, a big component of a lot of the ETPs and a lot of the, the volatility ecosystem that has sprung up over the last decade uh, after volatility really started really started taking off. So yeah, that's something we'd be happy to explore. So there you go, Miller. You're, you're, you're booking travel for all of us here with your question. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That's a good question. I think there, anyway, I think there does need to be some more, um, you know, a conversation about this kind of space and what's going on and, and for the pros and maybe even for the, you know, the active retail guys out there too. So yeah, we'll look forward to uh, uh, a busy travel schedule. You can all build Miller for uh, for that in the end. And that's going to do it for this extra special live to tape, at least, uh, from OIC edition of Volatility Views. But before we're done, we go back around the horn checking with each other. I know, Simon, in addition to all this other, you got a lot of stuff going on in the Volatility Hopper over there at T3. Uh, give us a little bit of hint, a little bit of a tease of what else is, is coming down the pike from you guys. Oh, okay. So we have um, uh, a volatility index that... So we, 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 we just launched recently... Uh, First Bitcoin volatility index. So never heard of that. What product is that? Uh, <laughs> so uh, so yeah, we, we teamed up with um, uh, Acuna, which is based both in Chicago and in Sydney. They are very active. One of the two most active um, market makers in the OTC Bitcoin options space. So we partnered with them. Um, it's called the Bitvol Index. It's on Reuters. I think the code is dot t three. BTC VOL. So if you want to look, check that on the daily basis. Mouthful of a ticker. Yeah, 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 it is. That's longer than my business card. <laughs> what gives? <laughs> but it is it is very impressively interesting, actually. You know, um, so we've been wanting to do this for quite some time, but there's a paucity of really good quality data. So we had to find a partner that was able to deliver. Is it? That. And I'm assuming it's a spikes methodology applied to uh, the Bitcoin effectively. So using the dragging, taking into account the skew and all the all the funds. It must have been a challenge. There. I know we, we talked about this before in the past, but now that it's Live. I must have been a challenge there because obviously it's the Bitcoin OTC options market still not as robust, shall we say, as a SPY or an SPX or something like that. So how, how, how much of a challenge was that for you guys? A very big one. That was probably the biggest challenge that we faced. So what we've done, we've decided to start with an end of day mm -hmm. version, but we are working furiously towards um, disseminating something that's more in real time. So, you know, whenever Akuna updates its portfolio, then we'll get disseminated with that information in real time and update it that way. So it is a it is a bit of a technical challenge because, as you say, there's not a whole lot of information and the information that's out there is kind of proprietary to people. So that, that having this relationship with Akuna has made this happen, essentially. And we're working on a couple of other things, I have to say, but uh, I'll save some of those for... Yeah, exactly. for the next time you wake up at four in the morning to, uh, yeah. to join us. Exactly. And you're, uh, hopefully they have strong coffee there in Sydney. I, 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 I've never <laughs> been there, so I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to check it out. And John, I know you've already kind of touched on a lot of your big teases. You talked the futures. We talked the forthcoming Viking. Uh, but if you have anything else in your hopper there, anything else in your quiver you want to share, maybe tease our listeners with what they can expect uh, coming from MyAx in the near future, sir. Now is the time. The floor is yours. Yeah, I, we do have a lot going on. We have, we have a, a great stream of entrepreneurs coming to our door showing us really interesting things. And it's a matter of, of, of taking it from, from, uh, from their head to paper to, to the screen and then seeing if people will trade it. That is a big challenge these days. We see great things, but, but the market makers are very uh, selective in where they apply their, their uh, liquidity. Uh, but for MyX, um, continue developing uh, the, the products that Simon brings to us and then I think uh, you can look, this is more on the uh, equity option side. I, th I think you can, we've got our, we've had our eye on the institutional space for a while. We think we have an offering uh, that will be very competitive uh, in a way that um, we, we, you, we can take advantage of what MyX does well, which is technology and apply it to the institutional liquidity world. That's, that's, a, that's probably uh, something that we'll get to the second half of the year, and then we'll ho hopefully, you know, if, if we execute as a team, we could have something out there um, before next year's OIC. There you go. 
Oh, I like it. A nice, vague, but an interesting tease nonetheless, sir. So that's going to do it for this episode of Volatility Views. And on behalf of John and Simon, who uh, I can confirm is awake and happy on to be on this show. We'll see next time he comes on. Uh, we shall see. And indeed myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening to all the stuff you put out throughout the week here at OIC. And there's a lot more to come. So stay tuned for that. And we'll see you back here next week for more Volatility Views. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.